Our Christmas sermon this morning is called, What is, uh, oh, sorry, uh, is Jesus God? But the first question we need to ask ourselves is, what is Christmas? Now, of course, it's always the babies. And there's all the stories of his uh, journey to Bethlehem, the, uh, the, the city where King uh, David had been born. It's the story of uh, wise men and shepherds. But in the early church, the most significant part of the Christmas story was that Jesus, who was God, had become a man. Now, it's fascinating. uh, If you look in modern times, there are some people who would say, oh, Jesus was just a good teacher. And if you said that in the early church, they would have been horrified because they said, no, he is God. Others would say, well, he's a left wing radical. And they try and somehow capture Jesus to equal their politics. Others would say, Jesus came to make us all wealthy. And wants us all to have Rolls Royces. And I've been in Rolls Royces. It's, not that, it's, it's an okay car, but it's not that great. Now it's interesting, uh, we can easily capture Jesus for our own agenda. But we need to come back to the Bible and say, what was the Bible teaching us about Jesus? How to begin in the early church? And when we read the New Testament, it seems obvious that Jesus is God. And that he was equal to his Father, God the Father. Now the conclusive proof of Jesus' full divinity can be seen when we compare certain Old Testament verses with New Testament verses. Many times the verses that would say this is God the Father are the very verses that are used to describe God the Son. So the key to recognising uh, Jesus is looking at the name of God. Now, uh, there are some people who would use the term Yahweh. We actually don't know how to pronounce Yahweh. Why? Because before Jesus was born, Jewish people were absolutely paranoid about saying God's name wrong. So if you want to say God's name, you say things like the Almighty or the Wonderful One. You use other terms because you were scared, you were actually petrified that if you said it badly, that you'd be zapped. And so there's a sense that nobody ever said God's name. It's the name that nobody uh, said and over time nobody actually knew how to pronounce it anymore. Now we say Yahweh, why? Because the Y... H-W-H is in the original Jewish writings. They didn't have vowels like we did. So you had to try and guess what words meant. And we use the term Yahweh, Yah, because of hallelujah. There's other parts where that phrase is used. And we know hallelujah, so the hallelujah, the Yah becomes the first part of Yahweh. So what does Yahweh mean? It comes back from the book of Exodus where it says, I am who I am am. It's a way that God described himself. And God explained his name to Moses during what is called the burning bush encounter when God commissioned Moses to free Israel from the Egyptian bondage and oppression. If you go back to Exodus chapter 3, it says this, Then Moses said to God, If I came to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is your name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So in the sense that the word of I am was transcendent. It's bigger than life. It's eternal. It reflects the nature of God. The one who is there at the beginning, the one who's there at the end, the one who's in control of all things. So when we turn to the book of Revelation 21, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I'll give springs of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have his heritage, and I'll be his God, and he will be my son. Who is the Alpha Omega? Jesus. This is one of the examples of scripture where God the Father and the, uh, the glory he has is poured out upon Jesus' shoulders. So what's the meaning of Alpha Omega? Simply A to Z, the beginning from the end. He was beginning of all things, and he will be there at the end. It's the equivalent to saying he always existed and always will exist. It is Christ, the second person of the Trinity, who brought about creation in the first place. So in John's Gospel, that we'll be going through this uh, between now and Easter, the very first verses in John 1.3, it says, Through him, through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that was made. So Jesus, as God incarnate, He has no beginning, nor does he have an end in respect to time. Jesus has lived from everlasting to everlasting. Mm. And in that process of everlasting living, he came to earth in human skin. He came to earth as a man. 
Now, the second meaning of Jesus as the Alpha and Omega is the phrase identifies him with the God of the Old Testament. Now, Isaiah many times describes this aspect of Christ's nature as being part of the triune God. So we find in Isaiah 41, I, the Lord, am the first, and I am the last, I am he. Or in Isaiah 44, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. This was a clear indication of God the Father. And yet the same terms are now used of Jesus. Jesus is the Alpha and the the first and the last, the same as his Heavenly Father. Now it's interesting, in Hebrews chapter 12, he describes Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. Signifying that he's there at the beginning, he's there in the middle, and he's there at the end. Now it's interesting if you go to the first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This whispers to us of Jesus. Because in the New Testament, in Colossians 3, it says about Jesus. For by Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. So it reflects right from the word go, Jesus was having his imprint upon scriptures. And we go to the last verse in the Bible, in Revelation 22, verse 20. He who testifies these things says, Surely I shall come. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. How does the Bible end? With the expectation that Jesus will return. Now, if you're a Star Wars fan, you'd be quite excited. There's another Star Wars movie out. I don't know how, how many they've made. Is it seven of the nine they've made, I think, out of the last... Yeah, seventh. seventh one, yes. It's something like 30 years or 30... Oh, was it 30, uh, 31 years of making movies? Like, you think, the one poor bloke... Well, people say, what have you done? I say, oh, I make a movie called Star Wars over and over and over and over again. And you kind of think, you poor guy. Aren't there other things you can do in life? But uh, it's interesting, at some point, Star Wars will finish. And I imagine the very last episode of... Well, he will die. At some point, he will die. But uh, when Star Wars finishes, I'm sure they had the last episode and there'll be like a little hook in the last 30 seconds making you think, there could be one more episode. And Revelation 22 says, little hook, Jesus will return. So who's Jesus? He's the first and the last. He's the one in all of all creation and salvation. He's the one who makes us right with God the Father. He's the one who makes us holy. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the last and the first. He's the A and the Z, the beginning and the end. Only God incarnate can make such a statement. And Jesus does that. In terms of the Trinity, there's the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. All three people are bound together in purpose and power and unity. And Yahweh is a word that is used to describe the three, God. So when we come to the New Testament and the Old Testament, are there verses that we're describing God the Father that have now in the New Testament been used to describe Jesus? An example of this would be in Isaiah 40, verse 3. It speaks about preparing the way of the Lord. And when we read these verses from Isaiah, in our head we say, oh, that's John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. But we need to go back to Isaiah and say, what did it say? Prepare the way. The way for the Lord, prepare the way for Yahweh. And the Lord would copy me L-O-R-D, be in capital letters to symbolise Yahweh. And so they were told, uh, that as a Jewish nation, prepare the way for God the Father. And these verses in Mark chapter 1 are used to describe Jesus. John the Baptist is told he will prepare the way of the Lord. But who's coming? Jesus is coming. Now in Joel 2 verse 32 it says... Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of Yahweh will be saved. Now we go to the New Testament, both the Apostle Peter in Acts 2 and the Apostle Paul in Romans 10 takes this whole phrase about prepare ye the way of the Lord and uh, call upon the name of the Lord is used for Jesus. That if anyone calls upon the name of Jesus, they will be saved. Now, if you were a Jewish person, you would have said, in the Old Testament, it says, call upon God the Father. Why are we now calling on Jesus? And a Christian would answer, because Jesus was God. Now, in Isaiah 6, it's a great uh, chapter. It has this massive vision 
Isaiah is in the temple and he's captured by the holiness of God. He's deeply aware of his sinful nature and uh, he says that this is to reveal the glory of God. Reveal the glory of Yahweh. It's interesting we turn to John chapter 12 and it says that this vision by Isaiah reveals the glory of Jesus. In Isaiah 44, the Lord, Yahweh, refers to himself as the first and the last. And we turn to the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, in Revelation 1. Jesus himself describes himself as the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. The same imagery that was used of God the Father. And in Zechariah 12.10, the Lord, Yahweh, is speaking and says this, They will look on me, they will look on God, whom they have pierced. And we said, who is the one who was pierced? Who is the one who was nailed to the cross? It's Jesus. So the imagery from Zechariah saying, now look upon the one who's pierced, finds its uh, fulfillment in Christ and Christ alone. So numerous times we're told that Jesus is eternal. Jesus is creator. Jesus is all powerful. And through Jesus is our salvation. These were all terms that were used of God the Father. and reminds us of the significant impact of what it meant for Jesus to come as a baby. Now, if I was God and I was going to come to earth, I'd want bodyguards. I'd want a palace. I'd want to be treated like royalty because I'm thinking, I'm dropping a long way from godness to humanity. That's a long fall. At least make me the best of humans. But there are no bodyguards for Jesus. Born in a stable, as a baby intensely vulnerable. If his childhood was the same as yours and mine, he probably didn't start speaking till his first birthday. And imagine close to his first birthday, poor Joseph trying to force Jesus to walk like most dads do. My father had a habit in our house that all babies must walk on their first birthday. And myself and my three brothers, we all walked before our first birthday because Dad just had in his head, you've got to walk. And why is that? Because we are vulnerable. And God, the powerful or creator of all things, made himself vulnerable. He became like you and I. And yet in Jesus, the fullness of the deity dwells, or Godness. As Colossians 2 says, it dwells in him in bodily form. Jesus Christ, who was born of the Virgin Mary, was both fully man and fully God. Both human and divine at the same time. As eternal God, Jesus existed before he came to earth as a human baby. He existed before the creation of the earth, before the creation of the universe. In fact, Jesus was instrumental in its creation. And the Bible says that all things were created by him and nothing that was made was made without him. In Colossians chapter 1, For by him all things were created in heavens and on earth, the visible and the invisible. All things were created through him and by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. In Hebrews 1 it says, But in the last days he has spoken to us by his son Jesus, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the universe. God is not a created being himself, but the creator of all things. Now it's interesting, if you were a good young Jewish boy, you would have learnt the Ten Commandments. And one of those commandments in Exodus chapter 2 is, You shall have no other gods before me. You are told to not bow down to anything on earth, anything which is created. But we find out that in the New Testament, Jesus is worshipped eternally. He's treated as God and treated in the place of the Godhead. When the Apostle Paul reflected on Jesus' ministry in Philippians chapter 2, he says, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The last book of the Bible, Revelations, in chapter 5, it says, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, 
You who are slain and by your blood ransom people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of priests to your God, and they shall reign on earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. As I said, there were people who would worship Jesus. After his resurrection, we, but the disciples really didn't think he'd come back to life again. The women come and rush into the room where they were hiding because they think if they've killed Jesus, they'll kill us. And they said, Jesus is alive. And the disciples said, you silly women. You've gone to the wrong tomb. You're emotional people. You're women. Why would Jesus appear to you? And they ran to the tomb and found it empty. But the angel said, wait, and Jesus will come to you in Jerusalem. At the first time Jesus appears to the disciples, they were all there except for Thomas. And they are captivated. And they're thinking, Jesus is alive. We didn't think this was going to happen. So when Thomas comes back into the room, they say, Jesus is alive. He says, you are as bad as the women. You emotional people. You're meant to be fishermen. Fishermen don't think like this. And for the whole week, Thomas is saying things like, I won't believe Jesus is alive till I put my hands in the wound in his side. I put my hand in the wounds in his feet, uh, in, his, in his wrists. And I put my, uh, my hands into the wounds in his feet. It's like it's this massive overkill by Thomas. In his eyes, seeing is believing, and he didn't see a thing. He just thought the other disciples were emotional. Here we turn to John chapter 20. Jesus comes in the room and looks at Thomas and says, Put your finger here and see my hands. Jesus knew what Thomas had been saying all week. Do not disbelieve, but believe, Thomas. And T Thomas responds, I imagine he fell on his knees in front of Jesus and says, you are my Lord and you are my God. A Jewish man would never worship anyone. A Jewish man would never say to another man, you are God. Yet Thomas does. Why? Because he recognised that God, the Lord of eternity, had come to earth in the flesh. So if Jesus is God, on this Christmas day, what should your response and my response be to the Lordship of Christ? In Philippians chapter 2, it says, Therefore God exalted him, Jesus, to the highest place, and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. As I said, Revelation chapter 22 finishes with the word, Come, Lord Jesus. I've said this illustration before, but I love this illustration. My mother's godmother, who lived to 99, would make comments like, I'm at 99 years of age, all my friends are dead. They've all gone to heaven without me, and they probably thought I've gone to the other place because I'm taking too long to get there. <laughs> and she had a two-word prayer that she taught my mother, that my mother taught me, that I pray often. Two words, perhaps today. And what did my mother-in-law's godmother mean by these words? Perhaps today is the day Jesus will come back. Am I living the life that God would want me to be living? Perhaps today. Why? Because at one point, all history stops. Every clock is frozen. Every person will see Jesus coming upon the clouds. The trumpet will sound. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords will return. For some of us will be holding our hands up and saying, Jesus is Lord in exaltation. And others will be upon their knees and saying, oh my gosh, Jesus is Lord. Everyone will recognise his Lordship, some with joy and exaltation and others with fear and worry. Why? The offer of salvation is to all. But have you responded? Have you asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life? 
Is he in control of who you are? Is he your king? Does he drive your life? Is he the one who's in control? Christmas reminds us that Jesus came to take over our lives. Let's finish in prayer. Father, Mo Father God, this morning, this Christmas, we've been reminded of the Lordship of Christ in our life. The need to have him as the king of who we are. Father God, forgive us for the times that we've tried to run our own lives as rebels. Father God, forgive us for the sins we've done that held us in distance from you. Father God, we call upon Jesus to forgive us, empower us and change us. Father God, may we live for your Lordship. Amen. And our final hymn this morning is O Come, All Be Faithful. And uh, while we're singing this, Phil will be round to... Uh...